and they're sitting there thinking like, maybe this isn't all that I want for the rest of my life, that you're looking for some other way to be creative or have something that's yours and a passion and run with it. And then at some point you start thinking or getting that itch to be like, I know I should just start. I should just start doing something. And this week I'm talking to Laura Kelly, who is a photographer and a business coach. Laura is walking us through how to get over the fear of putting your work out there and starting a business around your lettering and calligraphy. She has five really helpful step-by-step tips for us to get past some of those fears. And I can't wait for you to hear this episode. So let's jump right in. Laura, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I think I'm just going to cut right to the chase in this just one and say that um, you are not like my usual guests. You're I'm not a calligrapher. <gasps> not an artist. No. Nope. You're not going to teach us an art mini lesson. No. Nope. And unless my subscribers um, are huge podcast listeners and, uh, or maybe they heard me on your show, they probably have no idea who you are because our audiences don't really overlap. So can you just give us the rundown of who you are, what you do, all those good things? Sure. Well, first of all, Becca and I are friends in real life. So maybe that's a piece of the beginning of the connection. Um, But yeah, my name is Laura Kelly. I started a photography business nine years ago. I was 21 years old. I was working in a corporate job and I just felt physically ill every single morning and was like, I can't be in a cubicle and behind a desk and all of that. So I started as a photographer and I went through a crazy boot camp experience where I essentially sold my soul to Groupon for the first year of my whole business. Ended up shooting 387 photo shoots over the course of eight months, um, which allowed me to go full-time in my business right away and, and just kind of live that life of figuring out the next step as I went. So that was really my the beginning of my story. Once I came out of that boot camp experience, I decided to become a specialist in wedding and engagement photography, which was my huge passion for a long time and still is. And then just one day, it was about two years ago, I was doing some thinking about where I wanted to take my business now that I had kind of achieved all the things that I wanted to do with it. And I was really faced with the question of, do I want to still be shooting weddings when I'm 40 or when I'm 50? And I had never really thought of that before. Um, And so that just led me to a realization that I'm going to start a second business, even though I don't know what it is, but I'm going to have to go through all those steps that I went through all that, all those years ago to figure out what it was that I wanted to do. So I started documenting my experience in creating this second career. Meanwhile, I didn't even know what it was going to be, which led me down a journey to start a podcast, which I still currently run. I put out about two episodes a week. It's called You Might Not Like It, which if you know me in real life, you're like, Yeah, I understand the title. And uh, yeah, so that takes us up to today. Right now, I split my time between working as a full-time photographer, having my podcast, and then also having a coaching business where I work with small business owners who are really struggling with just being overwhelmed with how many big ideas they have and need some help and guidance kind of splitting apart those big ideas and turning them into actionable steps so they can actually start doing those things. Okay, which... All of that to say, like that last part is why you're here. Having you on here is really helpful for people who are debating starting a business, not only because you're a business coach, but because like you said, you went through this crazy boot camp of starting your own and your photography business is very successful, successful enough that you're going to be my wedding photographer. So, (laughs) (laughs) Um, but yeah, like I, I just feel like for anybody in my audience, and I know there's a lot of them because I get these questions all the time, who are debating starting a, a business or have started it and don't really know how to make it take off, I think that you're uh, the right person for this conversation. Yeah, for sure. And so, side hustle is absolutely like it's it's a term that gets thrown around a lot. Sometimes that represents people who are still working in their full time job, and side hustle just means that they can use that term as a way to be like, listen, that's not my real job. Um, same goes for people who are maybe they left a corporate environment during a mat leave, and now they're at home, they're with kids, and they're sitting there thinking like, maybe this isn't all that I want for the rest of my life. I don't not that it's just want to be home with my kids, but that you're looking for some other way to be creative or have something that's yours and a passion and run with it. And then at some point you start thinking or getting that itch to be like, 
I know I should just start. I should just start doing something. Um, but I, okay, I, I want to get into your five things, mm -hmm. but before that, I just have one question. So what is the most common roadblock that either beginners or aspiring business owners that you're working with have in their mind? Because I think that one of the ones that I most commonly hear uh, from my audience, and I'm curious if it's just an art thing or if this is an everyone thing, is that they're afraid that whatever they're doing- People will hate it. That, well, yes, it's <laughs> sort of the same thing. I was gonna word it differently, but um, for, for me, it's or for my audience, it's just that their art isn't good enough yet of to course. sell or to make money from. Or that, um, you know, because they haven't been doing it for, you know, 10 years and they haven't done their 10,000 hours or whatever, that they're not worthy of making money from it. Is that the same, is that the same thing? Because to me, it just makes sense that that's a worry for artists because their work actually has to be beautiful to sell it. Um, but is that a thing? But if you take that out and you, you can literally apply it to any single industry, right? This whole, this whole idea of their art's not good enough. Okay. Think of a person who's struggling, like, should I be writing a book? They're like, well, is my writing good enough? Right. Is, do I have what it takes? And the other thing that factors into that is there's already people doing what I do who are way better than me. So where is even the spot that I sit at the table? Like, where is that spot where there's a customer who's looking for this product, service, or art piece who's going to choose me over what they have, over what the other options are? And that's where I think we all live inside our own bubble. We all have, like, if I think of, you know, the best hand letterer in the world, I mean, that's my friend Becca, but you have this, you live inside your bubble where that means something totally different for you. And you pick a person halfway across the world, you ask them the same question. That's, you know, if they, they might think of my friend Becca, but like they also have other people in their life that they're going to answer that question for. Right. So the idea that everybody already knows the people who are better at what you are trying to do than you are, you might be the best person that somebody in your life right now knows and, and that your taste level as an insider is so far removed from what the conversation should be, but what a customer wants. And so it really does come back to this whole idea of like, they're going to hate it. Right. And, and like, let me tell you, it's pretty scary to shoot your very first wedding when you think, oh, okay, if they hate it, or if I actually can't complete the task, then this couple doesn't have a first kiss shot. Well, that's important, right? So that is the exact same conversation, them hating it, or you failing at it, or you not being good enough for it. I mean, that's everyone's greatest fear about anything ever. Yeah. So I guess, okay, the answer is yes, that's a common one for everybody. It's not just artists. It's not okay. just artists. The one, okay. I said that I was only going to say one more thing before we got into your thing, but then you started talking about this bubble. And mm -hmm. I remember hearing that concept when I first started and it just like changed the world for me because it's true. My bubble, my whole, you know, let's just talk Instagram, for example. My yep. Instagram is all hand lettering. Right. So of course, when I see it, I'm like, oh, I'm not as good as that person. I'm not as good as that person. I'm not as good as that person. And you're just like inundated with it. You and also then, have the concept that everyone's a hand letterer. Yeah. So then Ryan and I went on our six month trip and we stayed in hostels and we stayed in places where we met a ton of other people and every this is where it totally like changed my mindset because every time we met new people and they were like what do you do and I explained to them what I do it was like blank look on their face like, like what they, is that they, they don't even know that this is a thing so the, totally the bubble is like totally your own kind of creation and so a following people who are not just in your bubble is helpful but then I also realized and one day I did this, I went and I started going to my followers. I would just like go in my followers, people who are following me, mm -hmm. click on their profile and go to who they're following. And just take a look at the that, big scope. And realize that I'm the only hand letter they're following. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And like, so I, when I started my podcast, part of my bubble was telling me everyone has a podcast now. Everyone that I know is coming out with a podcast. It's because I follow coaches. That's because I follow people who have that type of value to share. And it's the perfect medium to have when you, that's what you have to share. Like it's a very natural thing. This is a very long intro, but, um, I think it was good. It probably got people fired up to hear these five steps. Yeah. So I think probably the best place to start, um, there's a Seth Godin quote. I've read a couple of his books that I like, but there's a Seth Godin quote that says, discomfort brings engagement and change. And discomfort means that there's something that others are unlikely to do and they're hiding out in the comfortable zone. So when you're in discomfort, essentially, I love the idea that this is the place that you need to be. And this is the place that you need to lean into a little bit. So 
Yeah, I mentioned a little bit about my background and about, for me, I really had to get comfortable repeating all those steps that I did to begin my first business when it came time for me to do my second. And I noticed that there were so many of the things that I was used to doing again and again and again. And every time I found myself in the discomfort, these were steps that I repeated. So I kind of jotted them down to figure out and to be able to translate to my, my clients, what are some of the steps that you can do to get over some of that fear of starting. And the first thing that I found that was really, really important is to do a brain dump and really get out. And and writing exercises are so important for being able to connect to what it is that's inside you. And if that for you looks like doodling something, drawing something out, for me, it looks like actually writing in kind of full sentences mixed with bullet points here and there, but really connecting with what I feel inside to get all of those thoughts out. And so some of the prompts that I give to my clients when figuring out what are the things, what are all the sources of your current fears and worries that are connected with what it is that you want to do. Some of the prompts that I have them write out are things like, I worry about the response from blank. And there might be one person, there might be multiple people in that, right? And other people's opinions, this is like such a great quote that I keep going back to, but other people's opinions of us are just none of our business. And I live by that every single day of my life. I try to have that as my mantra. But when you write out that prompt, what you're really answering is you're figuring out who are the people that hold power over some of your thoughts and some of your actions. So sometimes these people are pushing you to do something in a way that's great. Sometimes these people are stopping you from doing something that you know that you should do. So that's the first prompt. The second one is, even though I want to do this, I can't help but feel blank. And that's going to be a lot of free flowing thought as well about some of the things that even though you might know these are not true, even though you might've worked really hard in your self-development journey to get over some of these things, they're there. You can't help but feel them. So let's bring them to the surface and start by writing them down. And the last prompt is, I know that this is meant for me because, and those are the affirming thoughts that we need to be really, really focusing on. And the idea here is that when you identify all the parts of the equation so that you know you know how to debate with yourself. You know how to start to look at the things that are in there that don't serve you. And you know the things that are in there that serve you really well. And you can adjust the power a little bit. We can turn down the volume on some of those negative ones and turn up on the other side. Um, so then the last prompt is, I know I was meant for this because, and this is this really becomes our affirmation. These are the things that we have to remind ourselves instead of choosing to dwell on those reasons why it's going to go bad. And those are things like, I can't see myself working at my corporate job forever or because somebody might actually love this for me or I deserve to be creative here or it'll be fun to see what happens and I also don't have to make a full living from it. I can explore. I can have a side hustle. I can make some money from it and be pursuing my passion at the same time. There's nothing wrong with not being full time in your creative pursuits either. Yeah, I think that's that's another important point is that you, you don't necessarily have to do it to make money. You might just be exploring this because it's something you want to do and maybe you could make money on it. doesn't mean you have to. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people get wrapped up in that or get confused with that and feel like if they're not making a lot of money on it, then it's not a success. But your definition of success might just be that it's making you happy. Yeah, exactly. Or it's paying for your supplies, you know, or it's, it's funding a certain part of your life that allows you to feel like you can have more fun with it. I think that's totally great as well. I, because of my boot camp experience where I sold a group on that made me a ton of cash over the course of two days, you know, I was really pushed into full time. I have no idea, although I don't even think I would have lasted much longer than the six months that I lasted doing both jobs, but I knew that I was looking to get out of a corporate job. So it's okay to be on that team as well. It's totally fine to go after either dreams, whether it's to own that side hustle or to really pursue it full time. Both take a lot of work. (laughs) Okay. I'm going to get into step two, which is get as much practice as you can. Now for me, for my photography business, this looked like creating an ad on Kijiji where I was like, I'm looking for 10 people that I can use for my portfolio. I want to accept these 10 shoots. I'm looking for three family sessions, one engagement session, one city hall wedding, one baptism, one graduation. I wanted to shoot it all. So I opened up and said, I'm looking to gain this experience. At the same time, I also reached out to every friend that I knew to ask them if I could take photos for them for free. And working for free, it's a bit controversial, 
I'm team work for free. I'm more team work for free for longer until you can be like an actual price that you're happy with and then launch fire to that price versus starting at like 10 bucks. Like I'm like, go free until you're ready to charge like 250. This, oh, I'm so glad you said that. And I know that there's people in my audience that are like, oh, Becca's happy. She's saying this. <laughs> in my pricing course, Joanne and I talk about that full price or free. And mm. I was going to say on your Kijiji ad, that for people who are watching that do not know what Kijiji is, it's like Craigslist. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but You could buy a couch or look for someone who's trying to do a free family session, either yeah. one. Um, I am all, I'm all about that. You can you do free for certain reasons. And one of them is to gain experience. And it's a great way to, if Carol at the office, if you were really worried that it was going to ruin your friendship, if it's free, there's no way that it can ruin your friendship. You don't owe her anything if it's free. So I, I, I love that. And that once you've done enough of it, you're confident and you know that you can charge for it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think free has a lot of different tools. One is to gain experience when you're new, exactly what we're talking about here. One is to foster connection with something that you might not necessarily know exactly how it's going to play out for you. But there are sessions that I've taken on for free, even when my regular price is close to $600 for a one hour shoot. And it's been because I know that there's an opportunity that's really equal for us both. And that this is a place that I can kind of consider a networking opportunity. I'm lucky too, because there's not a ton of fees associated with shooting. It's not like a craft where you might have a lot of really expensive gear. I'm not selling a product that I'm giving for free. So it's not subtracting money from my bank either. But then the other thing too is to explore different stuff than you've tried. So I think building a portfolio is really cool because you can see what you love to do and don't get me wrong. It's not going to be super glamorous as you build your portfolio. Like I shot a pink and black and white zebra first birthday party that was like off the walls. But then when a birthday party that was a little bit more like what I wanted to shoot or kind of aligned with my goals came up and she said, have you ever shot a birthday party before? I can be like, absolutely. I have. And I have some tips for you on how we can make it smooth and how, you know, some things that I had kind of ironed out from that as well. And I did that same thing when I started my coaching business and I recommend getting as much practice as you can from lots of different ways. And just, I truly believe, I believe so strongly that the way to get your name associated with something is to be immersing yourself in that culture. And so that has worked for my photography business where if there's a certain venue I want to work at, well, better believe that I'm going to be doing a free shoot or a styled shoot, which is something that you set up that has models in it and that kind of thing at that venue. So I can get my name associated with those things. So if you want to be the person that's associated in your office, in your group of friends, in your whatever, you need to be that person who's out there offering all those things. And don't be afraid to accept things that are experienced that you're already like, oh my God, they want cheetah what? And you're like, I'm going to hate this. You never know how that experience is going to come back to you and allow you to then take something for a fee that is aligned with what you want to do. Yeah. So there's another thing that I would say for calligraphers and letterers specifically on this, and you mentioned styled shoots and I have another interview that I did about styled shoots. So I'll link to it. But another thing too, is that for calligraphers and letterers, and I've talked about this is to even just create things that aren't real. If you don't have somebody who's hiring you, even if it's free to do something right away, just start creating things, start making fake, uh, you know, wedding invites. Yeah, absolutely. Them. Start doing seating charts that are fake. Even, even if it's not for a client, it's still really good practice. And then same thing as what, as what you were saying, Laura, like find people who will get you to do it for free because that's also practice, but it will get you potential clients in the future. So I think both of those things are, are super valuable at the beginning. And I, w I would even say if you want to take that one step further, you know, I'd suggest if you have a person in, in your area who does decor rental or, you know, they have um, a, sh a showroom of plate, like let them know that what you're doing is you're going to be taking photos of a collection of your pieces, whether that's an invitation or a menu card, place cards, whatever it is that you're creating a seating chart. And you, you're saying, I would love to have, you know, decor in those photos. So could I come and style a few of your pieces and, and I'll make sure that we send you all the photos or, you know, it just gives me an opportunity to get in there and use your stuff instead of trying to hunt around and find my own. And that looks very different than asking someone, Hey, I'm creating a styled shoot. It's like a big thing and I'm really doing it. Instead. It's just, can I 
I'm going to be playing. It may as well be in your showroom if you feel that that's a good fit. And you might send those emails and you might get people saying, no, sorry, we don't accept people into our showroom. That's totally cool. You know that that door is closed for you at this point until you have something more to give but you might be surprised at who says yes to you and who's just excited to, Hey, it doesn't really cost me anything to have you try in my space. So let's see how that goes. I also think that you can do some work for like social media influencers too. You can go online and find someone who has said something powerful in a, in a post that they've written, you know, and turn those words into something, send it to them in a graphic that has your name on it. Right. And, and let them know, say, I made this, I was inspired by something that I read that you wrote and I just wanted to let you know. And I just wanted to like, is it okay if I shared this with my audience and it, and you know, I'd be happy if you would as well. And that person is going to go, that's so cool. Like everyone who thinks that everybody else is an influencer, those people are still really jazzed when somebody reaches out and say that they were inspired by what it is that they created. I guarantee you. So creating that work for other people, even though there isn't that cost associated with it might have a, a really good impact. Yeah. I think for letterers and calligraphers, that's really easy to do. Also, instead of just lettering a random quote you found on Google, letter something that might potentially like you can't bank on that person resharing it, but who knows it could happen. Yeah. And make sure it's timely. Make sure it's a new post that they've done, you know, make sure that you're following someone who's active, someone who has reposted art from other people before, you know, you may as well spend your time pursuing doors that are half open than ones that are locked up tight. So definitely a person who's like a real human being on Instagram and listen, that person doesn't have to be famous for you to have that impact. I wouldn't suggest going after people with millions of followers. If you're new and starting out, go after someone who has 900 followers in the town that you live, you know, go after someone who has 650 followers, but they seem to be commenting and engaged on the work that she's done. Don't discount those people just because they're not quote unquote famous and they're not in your bubble. Okay. Step three, start before you're ready. This one is so important that I actually created a podcast episode all about how to start before you're ready. If you want to see it, it's laurakelly.co slash ready. You can have a listen to that whole episode just dives in on trying to figure out exactly when is that right stage and how that right time in your life is kind of an illusion. And I think that's something that people who have been in business for a while know that to be true of anything that they try to change. That right time doesn't exist. It's the same with having kids. There's always a better month where things would work out better if you <laughs> waited or did it earlier. So yeah, the right time doesn't really exist. And I think there's a lot of cues that we can set up in ourselves, to tell ourselves that we're not ready. And some of those cues are total BS. So that's step three. I heard a, I heard a quote recently. I honestly am so upset that I can't remember where I heard it because I keep repeating it and it's just go set ready instead of ready set go. Oh yeah. I feel like you said that at a mastermind and nobody got it and you were like, guys, guys go set ready. <laughs> it's it. go like, set ready. Start before you're ready. Yeah. I love that. And I, I, because I've always said done is better than perfect, which is mm. kind of a different iteration of that. But I love go set ready for like the, even before done is better than perfect. Yeah. And I think that applies to like gear as well. The idea that you don't have to have, you know, the perfect materials before you can just begin. Like, I love that you have marketing about, and you have content about how you can do calligraphy with like a Crayola marker that your kids have. Like this is, it's just, an, it all comes back to the same thing. The idea that all these things that you have maybe subconsciously been telling yourself are reasons that this isn't for you, that you're not ready, that this isn't a good time, that somebody else is going to be better suited for this work because they have X, Y, and Z to their name, or they've gone through such course, you know, like everyone can come into any type of industry at a different time and you can make it work. There are scrappy ways that you can make it work. Yeah. So I think, um, the, the thing that I really preach in starting before you're ready is that you actually, you are ready today to create your first offer. And that sounds scary to a lot of people because of what we think the word offer means, which is, you know, for some, it could be a course for some, it could be, um, uh, something in an Etsy shop. That means I'm ready to like have my first product, right? Or I'm ready to start putting on my website that this service costs this many dollars. And I think that we often let that convince us that we're not ready, but offer can mean a lot of different things. And so my question is, if you, if I told you factually, you are ready to create your first offer today, 
are there some creative ways that you could actually think about what that offer might be? And for some, for the people who are just beginning, for people who are so new, you know what the best offer is? It's asking your audience to join you on your imperfect journey towards learning how to do this. Sometimes the best offer that you can have to somebody else is admitting I'm new. I'm trying, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm inviting you along on my journey where I'm going to show you my mess and I'm going to show you the progress and I'm going to show you all the ways that I'm trying to make this work for me. And I'm not perfect right now, probably never will be, but I'm on a journey to be better at this. And so documenting the ways that you're starting. And I love that your students seem to be pouring out all of that stuff about how they're doing it. But I'm sure there are still people who are so fearful and they'll never post anything before this. You know, they'll never show up and say that they're trying it at home. But- Which is a shame because I, I remember when I was starting and I was just sharing pictures of my amateur calligraphy and I didn't have very many people following me and those that were following me were probably friends and family. Yeah. (laughs) But sharing that I was learning how to do it and that I was starting to get better at it is what got people to start asking me to do it for them and what got the gears going that I could potentially do this for money. Like the first client I ever got was a friend whose sister was getting or was sister was having a baby and she wanted me to help her put calligraphy on the invites. And she knew it wasn't perfect because she saw me learning on my Instagram and she was totally fine with that. But if I hadn't been sharing that, then she would have never known. And I would have never even had the idea that I could possibly do this for a client. Yeah, exactly. And even like, let's say you have been showing up, let's say you have been, you know, keeping people up to date with your journey so far, but you're ready to take that a little bit deeper. It doesn't mean that the next step beyond that is to put something up on your Etsy shop or put a price tag against something that it is that you offer or some sort of service. There are middle steps to that. Like maybe weekly you could show up on Instagram live and give people an update about what it is that you've learned the last week or some of your, you know, here's a roundup of my five best resources that I've discovered over the last month. And you could turn that into an email. You could turn that into a YouTube channel. You could turn that into just showing up face to face on stories or in feed. And there's so many ways that that is still an offering to your audience. And yet somehow somehow we've tied that up with that has to have, that has to be like dollar signs everywhere for us to believe that that is an offering. So I just, when I work with my coaching clients and we're working through that stage of pushing themselves into going after what it is that they want, I really question all those things that we believe need to be dollar signs and ask kind of what are those middle steps? What's that in between? And I think part of that too, is that speeding up your offer, like doing that part before that you're ready is such an important part of the process. Cause it gets people talking exactly like the example that you just shared. People know what it is that you're doing. They can talk about you to others. And if they can't use it, they at least know how to potentially get you a referral. Okay. Step four, this is such a good one too. Um, the most important thing that I think we can do after we start practicing and documenting it is to emotionally prepare for the results to be invisible and for us to not be able to directly see a correlation between hours spent working on something and money in our bank. Like that's a really clear one. When somebody, when you offer something and somebody pays pays for it and then the money goes in your bank, that's a clear, those are results. And when you're practicing something and you're getting better, that's for sure a result that you can measure and that's tangible as well. As long as you're making sure to check in with it and see the thing that's not as measurable is if you are trying to show up and you're documenting your journey and you're getting 10 likes on a photo that you're sharing of something that you're trying. And then two weeks later, you're still doing it and you're still getting 10 to 11 to 12 likes on it. And you're thinking like, why is my Instagram not growing? Like why I'm putting myself out there and I'm sharing, but new people aren't finding me or people aren't commenting. Like my audience isn't getting acclimated to what I'm trying to show them or what I'm trying to do. Or I tried to do a workshop, but like nobody voted on my poll saying that they were ready for that type of workshop. So what do I do now? And I think that that's where we have to get comfortable with the idea that all work that we do that's to build that foundation of what it is we want to create is going to feel invisible until the day that it's not. It's going to feel invisible until that email comes in where someone says, Hey, I've been following you on social media for the last couple of months. And I was wondering if you do this, I didn't see any pictures of it, but would you be able to do this? It's for my sister's, you know, bachelorette. And you're like, where did that come from? Like, okay. So obviously the last thing that I did worked, 
but we don't know what it is that worked. We, what we know is that you spent time creating that foundation and it felt invisible until it wasn't. And so in those stages where it feels invisible, those are the times where you think that you're going to quit. Those are the times where you think you're going to stop posting. You think it's not working. I need to change something. That's the times you're Googling, like, how do you grow an Instagram following? Those are those times of doubt where you need to be reminding yourself that you don't know what's ahead. Just keep building your foundation. These principles work and they work for a reason. And they work if you work it, you work if you work it. This is like so cliche. Um, I also heard another, I'm like the queen of quotes today, but I heard another one that was just, just do the next right thing. Okay. Well, that's a quote from Frozen 2. So, and do the next right thing. <laughs> Kristen Bell sings it. It's pretty, it's pretty dope too. Never, I don't have children. I have not seen Frozen 2. I've not hey, seen well, Frozen 1 actually. <laughs> um, I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> you need to watch frozen one and two asap okay well because then you'll be quote city next week for like all kinds of other stuff yeah it's a song it's a song from frozen two it's essentially about depression but i think it circles back to a lot of things that we've been talking about of like yeah you are building a foundation and you won't you're not going to necessarily see the output from all the stuff that you're putting in at this stage until you do until you do <laughs> and I, like on the flip side of that is that while your progress might feel invisible, your mistakes are going to feel like there's a spotlight on them. And anytime someone's not happy with what you do, you're going to feel like it's someone's got like a horn and they're like echoing it to every single person that they know. And that you're, you know, the walls are coming down in your life. Like it's, it feels big when you make mistakes, but it doesn't feel big when you're making those like when you're just putting in that consistent work. So just knowing that that's what the ratio feels like is going to prepare you so that when that mistake happens, you're not, you're not sitting there going, well, I can't see any progress and I can see my mistakes. So clearly I'm not made for this. It's just going to set you up with a healthier mindset to be able to deal with those things. Yeah. And set you up with a mindset to deal with that continuously. Cause that doesn't go away. <laughs> It doesn't go away ever. It doesn't go away ever. And that's, that's honestly the secret about all of this stuff. Like any time you could be, I'm telling you, Tony Robbins is still working his way through these five steps in some kind of format or another, right? Because this is some, this is a pattern that I saw so clearly when it came time for me to build that second business. And I recognize that there's pieces of it that you just get better at the more that you try. And if you get stuck at step one, which is those fears and those things that the, these hangups and Amy and Carol at your work, who's going to hate the work that you do. And your friend is going to think that you're copying her and your parents who think that you should have stayed in school. Like these are all the things that get people stuck on step one. Right. And so for those people who haven't taken the time, that's why it's really hard to get to step two. That's why it's really hard to write down on paper. Like what is stopping you and what do you really want? Super tough. Yeah. But we're ready for step five. Step five is my favorite. Okay. Hit us with step five. Okay. So first of all, I have a, like kind of a, a general fear of old people. So this makes step five kind of funny and interesting, but, um, Okay. So this is something that I have reconnected with many times in the last decade. Somebody said this to me a long time ago. They said, what would your 80 year old self think about your current problem? And some people get this too shall pass tattooed on their wrists. But for me, I just choose to kind of, I will sit and think about my 80 year old self, who she is, what she cares about, what is going to be important to me when I'm super old and what's going to feel really far away and what my, what my priorities are, what my values are and how close, like how close can I get my life right now to the life that I want me to be remembering when I'm 80. And so that's where I think you start to get like, this is now a topic of like, how do you live a good life? Right. This is like a little deep where we go, okay, well now how do you prioritize the stuff that you're going to wish that you did? when you're 80 years old. But for me, this is how I can disconnect from some of those fears. This is how I can disconnect from the, the Amy and the Carol, right? Where I'm like, when I'm 80, I'm like, Amy who? Amy who? <laughs> right? So Carol. Carol, Carol, I think worked in the HR. Yeah. The so H, the HR, the HR. <laughs> so 
I will come face to face with my 80 year old self often when I'm in a place of thinking that these fears are going to take over my life and keep me at stage one or step one and keep me from making all of that progress. So knowing what your values are for some people, that's going to be compassion for others. It's admiration for others. The things that we do are because we want other people to think that we're great, right? We want other people to like us. So in that sense, if that's one of your goals and that's okay, that's a goal of like, I think that's like 20% of the population, their ultimate goal is admiration. I'm team admiration. And for those people, it's okay. If you're coming out of the closet right now and you're like, Oh my God, I think my life goal is to be admired. You're not alone. I just want to like soothe you for a second. But for those people, you have to connect with the idea that that might be your ultimate goal. And so how can you be admired by the most people in your life before you're really, really old? So think about your 80 year old self. What are her problems? What does she care about? And if these things don't align with it, they're just not worth your effort. They're not with your energy and you can't please everybody. And when you're old, you're not even going to remember their names. So I feel like a lot of what, like all of this comes back to is just kind of connecting with yourself and why you want to do this. Amen. Uh, But truly a lot of people will skip those steps unless they have somebody telling them in an episode like this to walk through those steps before you do anything. Yeah. Cause there's louder voices out there saying, stay in your corporate job and, and get a promotion and make money there and retire at 55. And there's louder voices, you know, that are currency in your life telling you like what's important and like how, what success means. And there's louder voices out there that are in, even that are inside you that are saying they're not good enough at this. So they're not even giving themselves the time to explore. Okay. What would it be if I really tried? So trying is super hard. Like that's why it's step one, but it's so worth it to get to step five and think about how you're so going to be old and it's going to be fine. (laughs) Laura, I feel like my 80 year old self will be very happy that you and I are friends. Me too. I think so too. I think we're going to like vacay in Boca Raton together. We're going to get the mastermind group all together again in like summer in Florida. Yeah. Love it. Um, Love okay. it. Lastly, can you tell people where they can find you? And I feel like you are going to get some podcast listeners who do like it. Yeah. This. Yeah, they do. Well, you can find me on Instagram at laurakelly.co. It's also my URL. You can learn more about the coaching programs that I have and the ways that we could potentially work together. The podcast is called You Might Not Like It, but you're going to be so down and into it. If you liked any of our chat today, you can find it wherever you listen to podcasts or laurakelly.co slash blog to have all the episodes right at your fingertips. Sounds like you've gone through that rigmarole before where people- Maybe. It it sounds like I might be like, rate and subscribe. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, thank you so much, Laura. I think this is absolutely going to help people out and light people's fire under their butts. Butts. I love that the last word of our recording will be butts. Butts.